An underappreciated magic ingredient of scientific success is fun. Joe has that in spades. had an interest in science and computers and things like that, but it was the emergence of AIDS that really struck me as a child. How is it that we have a disease that you don't know what causes it? And that concept of going after a disease to figure out what is the cause, in this case a novel virus, really captured my imagination as early as junior high, and I never really let go of it. What really captured my fancy about Stanford in particular was just the level of sophistication, the incredibly smart people that were there. I was just so blown away. And in particular, I had met Pat Brown on my interviews. And I thought, first of all, this guy's like one of the smartest people I've ever met. And I think he's crazy. This is where I need to be. When I first saw his lab notebook, I thought, this should be in a museum. I mean, he cares about every detail, including the aesthetics. And he's not only extremely, you know, creative and insightful and just a really great scientific problem solver, but he's very disciplined and well-organized and meticulous. <laughs> Words that you'll never hear attached to me. New technology was emerging, and one of the technologies that Pat was developing in his lab was something called DNA microarray technology. This was the beginning of functional genomics. This was a really exciting time. The idea that if you had the full genome of an organism, you could then assay instantaneously the changes in gene expression in all the genes in the genome at the same time. And you could do this in the space of one day. If you were watching a movie by staring at one pixel on the screen at a time, and then trying to understand what's going on there without that context, it's categorically different when you see each pixel in the context of the bigger picture. My reaction when he expressed interest in that was like, why, you know, I was so welcome to have him on it. And he immediately was, okay, here's, here's a list of 10 things that, you know, need to be improved. They would take shifts because, of course, it was 51 hours straight. They would sleep in the lab. You could see how this technology was going to change scientific investigation. And at the end of it, the photo is scrawled with a, you know, dry erase marker on a piece of paper. Yeast genome completed, 51 hours, 707,520 spots. Bang, done. Anyway, uh, that was a celebratory moment, even if it's a kind of a crappy photo. Once this technology became very popular, Joe started getting calls daily from people all over the country, all over the world, asking about this technology. And because they didn't know who he was, they assumed he was a faculty member. And so um, because they assumed he was a faculty member and I often answered the phone, they assumed that I was his secretary. So that became a running joke between us. He would affectionately call me his secretary and I would call him someone who never returns people's calls because he never called these people back. DNA microarray technology allowed us to analyze thousands, if not millions, of different pieces of DNA simultaneously. And this was really the advent of functional genomics. Now, ultimately, DNA microarray technology was surpassed by next generation sequencing. But all the foundational work, how you look at a whole genome's transcriptome, how you analyze the data, what do you do with that data, how can we use it to diagnose infectious disease, we did that all in DNA microarray technology before next-gen sequencing. And then next-gen sequencing just made it better. Joe is really animated by the translational, direct clinical applications of his research. There's a whole significant uh, arm of his lab that's really poised and always working on not only groups of samples from patients with a particular disorder, but even individual uh, patient samples with someone who's in the hospital with some type of critical illness. I just collected 
In 2016, I was really given a very special opportunity. Together with my co-founder, Steve Quake, we were able to establish a new nonprofit research institute supported by Mark Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chan. This is called the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub. One of our special projects that we have is actually a rapid response team. It's a team that actually works with many groups all around the world, including a large proportion of those being low and middle income countries, to be able to use cutting edge genomic technologies to investigate emerging infectious disease wherever it might occur. Joe understands that the currency in science is really a publication, that if you can't get the data out there for people in the wider community to digest, it's not gonna help anyone. It's remarkable that he's able to um, keep track of and manage you know, projects ranging from uh, cancer diagnostics to infectious disease studies to basic virology studies to malaria drug discovery programs. I was really turned on to malaria research by a visiting professor, Pradeep Rathod, who was actually visiting Stanford when I was a graduate student, and he said, you know, you're working on yeast and this is all really great, but you should look at malaria. It's a deadly disease, it's a worldwide problem, and it needs a lot of people to get into it. And together with my colleague, Kip Guy, over many, many years, we now have a drug that has passed through phase 2B clinical trials. And we're raising the money now for phase 3 clinical trials, and it's probably going to be one of the fastest clearing malaria drugs ever used in humans. Joe is very ambitious, and yet he's Californian at heart, you know, so you have this laid back attitude, and yet he's very driven to move the science forward. He's extremely generous with his resources and technology and expertise. And he's also trained a huge number of individuals who now can then continue the dissemination of the technology to the wider uh, scientific community. Joe's really been a pioneer in open access science. He's really broken that mold um, and shown that you don't have to be an insular lab to be a good lab. I think many of his mentees try to approach their scientific work in, in that same way. I can easily say that uh, there's certainly no one that I can think of who's more deserving of this um, award. Both Paul and Arthur, they were pioneers not just using established methods to solve new problems, but solving problems that required new methods to be developed in order to solve them. Like them, his willing to tackle important unsolved problems without necessarily knowing in advance how to solve them. He cares about science in the broader context of what matters in the world. I feel like that's just sort of canonical of Joe DeRisi. I often get asked, especially when I talk to new students, we don't, what do I actually enjoy about science? What really drives me here? And it's the thrill of discovery. It's the fun of actually figuring out something that was unknown before. It's like a puzzle. And if the solution to that puzzle helps a human being, even in the near term, even better.